It's this sorted. it's just sorted. round table on polarization um, featuring you know three you know top scholars on on the topic I was I was trying to think of ways to describe the round table without uh, without you know offending other people who just presented because if I call them all stars then it the implications that others are sort of minor leaguers and that's not what I want to so then I thought well this is sort of like the Olympics where you know a every participant in the Olympics is is like the best at what they do, but for whatever reason, you know, when, when you tune in during uh, prime time, you know, NBC will show you like figure skating. So this is like our figure skating panel <laughs> on, on polarization. Um, uh, and, and so it's my uh, pleasure to introduce to you uh, uh, Mo Fiorina, who, uh, of course, we, we all know uh, the book Culture War, which is now in its what, third edition, I believe. Um, and uh, in which she advances this, uh, uh, this thesis that uh, has uh, generate a lot of debate. Um, uh, Mo is the uh, Venn family professor of political science at Stanford University and a senior fellow uh, at the Hoover Institution. Uh, we also have uh, Francis Lee, who's uh, a professor at the Department of Government at the University of Maryland. Uh, Francis has written uh, uh, a lot on uh, polarization, on partisanship. Uh, her uh, recent book uh, on politics or principle uh, has won, uh, was it two, three awards? I mean, I, only two. Well, <laughs> it has won many awards, uh, and it's, a, it's an excellent book, and so she, uh, she uh, agreed to, to be on this roundtable. And then we have uh, Sarah Binder, who is a professor of political science at George Washington, a uh, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, uh, who uh, has also written extensively on gridlock, uh, stalemate, uh, the filibuster, uh, and both Francis and Sarah were on the uh, APSA task force, were members of the recent task force on political negotiation. And so uh, we're delighted to have all three of them here. Uh, so we're just going to have uh, Mo uh, uh, present some of his uh, recent finding, and then we're going to have uh, 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 Francis and Sarah uh, then uh, uh, present their own uh, work on this topic. Thank you, Antoine. When uh, Jim Thurber invited me to this conference, I said no. And uh, I, <laughs> it wasn't being antisocial, it's just that after 10 years, I simply have nothing new to say or write about this topic. But uh, Jim, as you know, is a very persuasive fellow, and so I, I ultimately agreed to come. And having done so, I'm glad I came now. First of all, uh, there's been a lot of really nice research presented today. So the field is moving forward, and I'm really impressed by some of the topics that have been picked up by the younger scholars here, so I've learned a good bit. And the second reason is I've learned that despite having nothing new to say, some of the old things I've said I haven't explained well enough because there continue to be misconceptions about what I've said. Uh, Tom Mann, in his uh, remarks at noon, uh, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but he, he, uh, he took exception to those who dismiss as mere sorting some of the, one of the most important developments of the, uh, today, and I agree completely uh, with that. This is something I wrote uh, uh, an essay a couple years ago um, where, where the section head is titled Party Sorting as the Underpinning of Polarized Politics, and that's the conclusion of the section right there, that in fact party sorting is what is, uh, I think, the problem fundamentally with what's wrong today, or the things that, put it this way, the things that are, are agitating many of us. And so I want to talk today about party sorting I can be brief because, uh, fortunately, Alan Abramowitz gave a paper on party sorting today. I'm not sure he intended it that way, but that's uh, exactly what it was. Uh, but let me, uh, let me go on just to review the bidding a minute. The, uh, the American media became infatuated with polarization narrative about 10 or 12 years ago. And you remember the red-blue states, the 50-50 nation, and the notion was we had separated into two camps with no middle. Now, if you spend your time mucking around with ANES data and other data sources, uh, well, what were they talking about? And this is what polarization is by the common sense definition. Say at time one, uh, Democrats are basically a left to center party with moderates and even some cons a conservative wing. Republicans are the opposite. At time two, the middle disappears. This is an extreme example. Everyone goes to one side or the other, 50-50. Now that's not what happened if you look at the, uh, the data out there. If you think of polarization in partisan terms, well, since the Democrats came through the rough patch in the 60s, it's been pretty stable. Democrats 35 or 40, independents 35 or 40, and Republicans bringing up the rear of 25 or 30. If you think of polarization in, in um, ideological terms, the GSS has been asking the same question for over 40 years. The same thing, trends are just pretty stable. The uh, liberals are always on the bottom in American politics with about 25 or 30. 
Conservatives, a little upward trend, 30 to 35, and moderates, middle of the road types, around 40 percent. We don't have the same kind of time series on individual issues, but people still tend to hug the middle. This is the, uh, the seven-point scales in the ANES in 2012. Uh, as you can see, they're peaked in the middle. And uh, to the extent there is any, uh, any real movement, uh, there's been a sharp shift to the right uh, in terms of age to, age to minorities, which is not an Obama phenomenon. It actually starts in the 90s and has just been continuing over the years. And Alan, in some cases, re recodes this data and forms an index, and he's able to show a little more polarization that way. But as, as David Brookman at uh, Berkeley has pointed out, it's not because people are taking more extreme positions. It's because there's more consistency that the, the issues tend to be more correlated, which I take as a manifestation of party sorting. Okay, so what is party sorting? Well, I'll go back to that first case uh, we talked about, where we have the Democrats, Independents, and Republicans fairly, the two parties fairly badly sorted. At time two, they're better sorted. The uh, Democrats have lost their conservatives, the Republicans have lost their liberals, and the Democrats are clearly a left of center party, and the Republicans clearly a right of center party. And obviously, all kinds of processes can contribute to this. People could be changing their party ID to match their ideology. They could be changing their ideology to match their party ID. Different people. When we compare 1974 to 2014, we're talking about different populations there. So we're talking about replacement, conversion, et cetera. So all, you know, and I think that's one of the things that really needs to be sorted out is, is what these various processes contributed to the process of party sorting. But just to give you an example, um, here's the abortion question which the GSS, the General Social Survey, has asked since 1972. They asked, should abortion be legal under six circumstances? And the top three are the so-called traumatic circumstances, danger to the women's health, pregnancy results from rape, or there's birth defect. As you can see, there's huge majorities in favor of abortion legal abortion in those cases. Uh, when it comes to marital status or an economic status, uh, there's the population is more conflicted. As you see, no, no change. On average, the population agrees with legal abortion in four out of six circumstances. There has been sorting underneath that aggregate stability. Here's Democrats, Independents, and Republicans looking at one out of, one out of six circumstances or zero out of six. Uh, Roe was decided in 1973, and the uh, by about the early 90s, Democrats have emerged as more pro-choice than Republicans. You see two uh, common aspects of the sorting process here. Uh, the first is that, as any number of scholars have pointed out, elites tend to precede the, the mass public, that ordinary voters respond to elites. Levandowski shows that, Carmen's and Stimson show that, others show that too. It took close to 20 years for Democrats and Republicans in the electorate to get on the right side of the issue that their, their uh, elites were on. Uh, the second thing is the sorting is not nearly as complete among ordinary voters as it is among the party elites. If you go back and read the abortion platform planks in the last uh, the 2012 camp, uh, platforms, the Democrats said basically any time for any reason. The Republicans said never, no exceptions. And uh, so, I mean, the, the, the elites are, would be at zero and six on this case, whereas the mass public, the Democrats are at about three and a half, the Republicans, or Dem Democrats are about four and a half, Republicans are about three and a half there. The, uh, Alan uh, mentioned today that there is a strong relationship between pro-choice or pro-life in the 212 ANES, and the population does appear to be fairly um, polarized on this issue, but this is part of the battery of, eight, of uh, eight or nine choices. And when you ask people, well, what about the threat to the mother's life? Uh, well, some of those people, a lot of those people who are opposed to abortion as a matter of a woman's choice say, oh yeah, for that reason, sure. Pregnancy results from rape? Sure. Birth defects? Sure. We have two to one or larger majorities. There's no polarization there. And by the same token, financial hardship, some of those who say favor uh, on the top question say, well, that's not a good enough reason. And when it comes to just not having the right uh, sex of the, fe of the fetus, people just really fail on that one. Now, on our old models, the median voter model, the two candidates would look at this data and say, okay, I'm for abortion, legal abortion in the case of threat, pregnancy, rape, birth defect, et cetera. I'm against it in the case of financial hardship, not the right sex you want. And both parties would drop that position, the election would be a tie, and the issue wouldn't have any relationship to the vote. But that's not what actually happens in the real world. In the real world, people sort of know the Republicans want to go over there into the opposed territory, even on those middle things. And they know the Democrats want to go over here to the, uh, to the favor territory, even on those bottom two things. And so you end up with polarization because of the candidates, because of the party positions. And that's a really important point I've tried to make again and again, that you can't just look at how voters vote or how they evaluate candidates, what they're doing, because it's not just, a, you can't infer from that what the voters' positions are, because it leaves out what the candidates' positions are. And the candidates are moving over the years. And I think a lot of the, the polarization that we see in the electorate, the sorting, can be re, uh, referred to or can be attributed to the candidates. 
Uh, take a look at party sorting. The top diagram shows sort of the older situation where the Democrats and Republicans are badly sorted. Uh, you have a lot of right-wing Democrats, a lot of left-wing Republicans, and then in the bottom they're perfectly sorted. There's no overlap. And just looking at something like in Gary's paper, uh, I think sorting can explain a whole lot of what's going on. Like look at presidential evaluations. Well, in the bottom, uh, the bottom one, the president is farther away from the average Democrat. So any positions the president, his agenda is going to be more offensive to the Democrat, to either party than in the top diagram. He's farther away. Look at uh, evaluation of the candidates. The candidate is going to be farther from you. The Republicans will be farther from the average Democrat. The Democrats will be farther from the average Republican. Uh, their uh, split ticket voting I'll come back to uh, in just a moment. And it occurred to me uh, earlier in the week that although party sorting provides, I think, a really plausible explanation for a lot of what we've observed, I don't think we've ever actually really tried to tack it down. Uh, so to the extent that if I end up writing a paper for this conference, this is what it's, it's going to be about. Uh, Sam Abrams and I, who write on this a lot, uh, did some runs earlier this week. How do you measure party sorting? Well, in his uh, seminal paper on party sorting, Alan Abramowitz points out the, uh, this is a 1998 paper, Alan points out the correlation, rising correlation between uh, the liberal conservative scale and party ID. And here is an example, and what we've done here is we've looked at self-identified Democrats and self-identified Republicans who voted. So this is, in a sense, the basis of the two party. And let me just uh, put an aside in here. I do not think it's a good idea uh, for to put independent leaners into the partisans for the following reason. It, 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 this goes back to the question about causal inference. Um, the, the, when you ask, there is evidence that you, when you ask an independent how they lean, they're partly using their vote decision to get, answer the leaning question. Say, I'm going to vote for Obama, so I must lean Democratic. So you're overestimating the effect of partisanship, underestimating the effect of, um, of, of underestimating the size of the swing vote. And we have a paper on this, I hope to finish by the end of the summer, but just a strong bit of evidence is this. If you look at all the waves of ANES -A panels, and we have 60 of them, the leaning independents are the least stable party ID category. On average, more than half move from wave to wave in every election. So they're, they're, and it's not just that they move, uh, they, about 25% of them, a quarter of them, move either back to pure independence or to the other party. So they're, they're moving, they're responding to the issues and the candidates in the election, and so there's a lot of endogeneity in here. And so this is essentially the people who answer the first, the root questions. I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. And so you can see there, the, core, the parties have sorted very much uh, on this particular scale. Uh, the, the correlation is now 0.7 among these the party bases here. Uh, we also thought it might look uh, interesting to do um, just the difference in the means of the liberal conservative scale. And again, uh, a lot of sorting there. It's, uh, the distance has doubled over time. Turns out these two things are correlated at about 0.9 levels. So. And then we uh, thought, uh, oh, by the way, um, almost everything has been pointed out. We, all the data we have are asymmetric. Uh, this is one example of symmetry, that it turns out that the, the partisan Democrats, the self-identified Democrats and Republicans have moved exactly the same amount over time, 0.6 of a unit. The difference is the Republicans start farther from the center and they end up farther from the center uh, where the Democrats do. So the, the levels, the Republicans are definitely more, uh, more off to one side, but the movement has been the same. Uh, we tried to take a look at some of the measures that have been used here today, and it's, it's tough. There's only 11 elections and everything's trending. But um, uh, using uh, looking at presidential approval, uh, the essentially extent of party sorting accounts for about half the shades. Uh, the variance in the correlation measure or less than that in the distance measure. It's not so good on Republican candidate rating. There's some funny things going on, like Nixon is pre-sorting, pre <coughs> but nevertheless, there's a big party difference on Nixon. Uh, Democrats' uh, candidate rating is, is, there's a lot of common variance there with the sorting measures. And split ticket voting is, is really high. And you think about split ticket voting, because here it's not just the case of the party sorting, it's the party elites, the candidates sorting. So there, there just aren't many conservative or, or Democrats for a Republican to vote for these days. There just aren't that many liberal Republicans for a Democrat to vote for these days. So as the parties separate and as the voters separate, yeah, why is there any, why split ticket? You know, they're, they're candidates all of a kind. So my bottom line is that, um, I th as I say, I think uh, sorting is at the bottom of much of this, and for that reason, like many of the people here today, I don't have much uh, confidence that any kind of reforms we've talked about uh, are likely to make, I mean, they're good in, in of themselves, uh, redistricting reform, uh, et cetera, but um, the, the fundamental problem is electoral. I'm with Keith Poole on this, that it's gonna take a big shake up of some sort. Um, we don't need a UE law, and I'd, I'd even settle for a younger, saner Ross Perot, as, uh, as uh, David Brooks said some years ago. 
But until one party wins and keeps winning, you can't just ping pong back and forth because you try to govern too far from one side or the other. Until we do that, uh, I think um, um, we're unlikely to get past our present problems. But I think the odds of that are greater than a lot of people do because I think the middle is stronger. I think the potential swing vote is bigger than people think. And so I think that there is a market there, although neither party is currently trying to serve it.